Yeah, great, good, good. Yeah, it's, uh, so it's Total Productive Manufacturing Gold. TPM, you may have heard of it uh, before. And it actually fits in quite well with uh, Arthur Stone's uh, presentation, because I, I guess I want to talk a bit about um, the reality of why something like OEE can help to, or how something like OEE can help to drive uh, continuous improvement. The good thing about something like OEE is, it is as, as uh, Arthur says, it's, um, it's, a lot, it's, it's a good indicator of trend. It's a lousy indicator of what happened this shift, last shift, this week. It's getting better. So let me uh, move on. Um, DAK, you see the name up on the wall there, stands for direction and knowledge. Direction is what we give you when we start, and knowledge is what we help you to develop. Uh, so that's the, the basis of our, our mission um, as a consultancy. Um, a couple of things I just want to share. So the next slide I'm going to show is uh, it's got a, a range of uh, boxes. And in the top left-hand box, we've got the benchmark, which is the starting point, the time and years um, that it took to achieve the, um, the achievement. Can I take this? Good. Yeah. Um, so what we've got here is, um, if you take the, uh, say, the air conditioning uh, company, we've got, um, we started an index of 100, and in six years they doubled their overall equipment effectiveness. So that's double the capacity. A uh, great way to get costs down is to get unit volume up, so major, major impact. A, a typical realistic and achievable goal when you're looking to improve effectiveness is, uh, is about 50% increase. Anybody care to give me a definition of what is effectiveness? What we measure when we measure effectiveness? Anybody there? Effectiveness? What would, you, what would you say? What are you measuring when you measure effectiveness? Profit. Profit? Sort of, yeah. Anything else? What else? Productivity. Productivity, that's in there as well. I'm going to try you. Effectiveness, what are you measuring? The degree to which you achieve your objective. Spot on, absolutely. It's how well do you do what you plan to do, the degree to which you achieve your objective. So if you're effective, put a plan together, it works. Yeah? If you're not effective, you, you uh, put a plan together, it doesn't work. And a lot of the times you find that a plan's put together, it's changed very quickly. So as you approach higher levels of effectiveness, it means that you do what you plan to do. So less management firefighting, people being where they want to be. Uh, when, the, when you come into work on the day with a plan of action, the higher the effectiveness level, the more chance there is of you actually getting the job done. Okay, now that has a profound impact on the way people work. So if we look at a typical improvement route map for, for TPM, if we start off with a level of effectiveness, whatever you measure, uh, and equipment starts to deteriorate, um, we get a, we'll get a failure. And at some point, it'll suddenly fail. Now, if we then fix it, we get the equipment typically back to a little bit better than it was before. Now, there are only two reasons for breakdowns. And by breakdown, I mean shaft is sheared or belt is broken. Two reasons. So, anybody care to hazard a guess at what those break, what the reasons are? No? Three reasons. <laughs> right, so the bad operation is one, so that's finger trouble, human error. The second one is condition. So if equipment gets past a certain point where, of, of where, it's more likely to fail. The, 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 the backside of that is the counter is that is if we get equipment in the right condition and we develop procedures that are easy to do right, difficult to do wrong, simple to learn, and we train people to do them, then we can eliminate breakdowns. Now, there's a difference between a breakdown and a minor stop, so on your line, a lot of the problems we have, if you're still in business, you probably don't have a lot of catastrophic breakdowns, you have a lot of minor stops. You get a jam, you have to clear the jam, the machine works. Now, you know, if you get a jam and you clear the jam, have you solved the problem? Just shake your heads? No? No, you haven't, right? Because if it's happened before, it'll happen again, won't it? So it's not very effective if somebody's got to stand there just in case. So part of the, the, the toolkit to get to um, zero breakdowns is, is getting equipment to the right condition, uh, make sure you've got the right asset care regime, doing things in a standardized way. And then the second part of the journey, which is a different toolkit completely, is about optimizing. So if you've got stable running, then you've got a different toolkit to, to get to 
higher levels of optimized uh, effectiveness. So this is where something like Six Sigma really kicks in, uh, in that you've got stable running. One of the things that stops you getting stable running is human error because people aren't trained, the equipment is worn out. So you know, there's lots of simple stuff that you can do. Now what TPN has done, or what it over the 50 or so years from when it was first uh, thought about, it, it might be 60 now, um, is it's put together a number of key things that you do just because that gets you to a high level of, of reliability. So you get equipment in the right condition and you make sure you've got standard practices. Pretty simple. Standard practices you get, you introduce, make sure they're across the shift. Just getting standard practices across the shift so they are standard is worth about 10% in effectiveness. So this, but the stuff that we tend to, in manufacturing, not bother about because we don't think it's important. So what TPM, Top Directed Manufacturing, does is helps us to get the stepping stones right and then, and then also um, identify how to get people engaged with processes that, uh, that will ultimately achieve high levels of reliability and, and optimization. Um, so these are the sort of things. The, um, out of, this is based on 500 years of equipment uh, runtime. It's, it's more like 1,000 now, but when we put this together, it was 500. Um, out of every 100 stoppages, 40 can be... Uh, these are sort of breakdowns. 40 can be eliminated by restoring basic conditions. You can read those. There's only about 15% that really needs equipment redesign, uh, where you've got a weak component. And for me, if you've got a weak component, then that's human error, because we didn't figure out how to, uh, to design it right in the first place. So that's the first bit of wisdom. Um, the second bit of wisdom is that if you look at practices, if you look at behaviors in the round, it gives you an indication of how good you are as an organization. So the OEE that um, I talked about before, each, each part of the OEE has got the losses. There are six losses. Um, two of them are very similar quality. So Now, each of those losses has got a different tactic for reducing it. So with breakdowns, I might have mentioned this before, only two reasons for breakdowns. Anybody remember what those are? Equipment condition and? You're not great, good. So, um, in terms of breakdowns, to get from level one to two, um, so that's breakdown maintenance is greater than plan maintenance, plan maintenance equals breakdown maintenance. What we need to do is we need to get um, equipment to the right condition, but also formalized ways of working. So for each of these types of losses, set up an adjustment, if we've got setup which is not where we've got, what we want is setup, we don't want the adjustment piece. So if it takes a long time to bed in a process, it's because we haven't got the adjustment right, the science isn't right, possibly we don't know how to run cardboard on a wet day and a dry day. Lots of things to learn. So what we've got is, in TPM, we've got, a cut, we've got tactics to get stable and then to get uh, optimized. So we have, have a stable process and a resilient process. The importance of resilient process is that customers are always going to want something new. In terms of quality, but which in the future, what, what are customers going to want in terms of quality, higher or lower? Higher? Cost? Yeah? Speed? Faster or slower? Faster? Legislation, are we going to have more or less legislation? Yeah, so you can sort of predict in general, yeah, I think you're going to have more, yeah. <laughs> so you can predict in general terms what you're going to the, the, the way the business is going to go. So in the future, you need equipment when you're producing products that make the money. You want it to be consistently running. You want operators to be running the kit at normal condition. And when, so when you bring in new products, which is part of growth, you bring them in and it doesn't mess up your product, your profit stream. stream. So TPM is, is designed to get you stable, free up management and specialist resource from the firefighting so they can focus on the new products, the new services, the new equipment, making the right decisions, bringing the legislation in, in a way that is, you've got time to think about it. So instead of being reactive, it's proactive. Now, I know that within a lean environment, TPM is often seen as being operator maintenance, and certainly the gen generally needs to be a higher level of operator ownership of equipment, asset care, uh, as, you, as you improve. But that's only really about a quarter of, or less than a quarter of what TPM is about. TPM as a process allows you to look at your equipment, set some targets in terms of effectiveness, and systematically move towards that, those targets, because we've got the, the tactics uh, set up to do that. And what you're actually doing is you're developing your capability as a company to, to solve problems. Starting off with, so on a scale of one to five, one is low, 
five is great, three is if you were there, you know, less than 1% of companies get to above three. Yeah, so if you want to be in the top 1%, you need to be looking at actually not just stabilizing processes, but optimizing it. To do that, you need cross-functional involvement. You need production and maintenance guys to talk to each other. If they did that, I'd be out of a job. Yeah, you need managers to talk to shop floor, shop floor to talk. You know, you were looking at communication. A lot of people issues in there. So it's not just the technical stuff. You do need the data, but not just the technical stuff. So what, what, you, what TPM shows you is how to progress through that, through that process. And the, the bit that perhaps isn't clear in the books is the impact that it has on people and on, um, uh, on, the, on working relationships. So there's a huge people side of getting improvement in place. So if step one is um, getting stable, what you're actually moving from is problem solving to focused improvement. Now when I say focused improvement, the difference between focused improvement and continuous improvement is that with focused improvement, somebody in the leadership team has said, that's the bit we need to improve. That's the outcome we want. We want stable running. If we want stable running, we know how to get there, get the equipment in the right condition. That's an engineering role. What is the right condition? Yeah? How bad is our stuff now? Could it, how, how, how much better do we need it to be? Typically, that's low cost or even no cost stuff. You know, it might be marking up a few gauges. But to move from um, problem solving to, um, to focused improvement, where you're focusing on specific areas of improvement, so is it set up, is it breakdowns? Yeah. Um, what you really need to be doing is to develop the lean team leader, develop the frontline manager, because there's a, there's a uh, profound change in the way frontline managers work in a, a good um, continuous improvement environment. So they're there as a coach, spending about 25% of their time developing their teams. Um, you've got um, people that understand the maintenance fundamentals, not just engineering, so they know why it's important. And problem prevention, root cause analysis is fine, but what you really want, you don't really want to know the root cause, you want to know how to stop the problem from happening. So problem prevention is, is a different sort of focus. And then the next stage is, is that, that gets you towards a point where the first line manager can move from being a supervisor where he's concentrating on keeping people working on the, on the line, picking stuff, uh, uh, moving stuff, uh, to somebody who's coaching. Now in that environment, the front line teams would have time for continuous improvement. We suggest around 5% of people's time. Now that's an investment, like you'd invest money. So you need to get a return. That's why it has to be focused. You need to know what return you want. And I've worked with lots of companies where they say, oh, we want to do lean. The wrong way around. You've got to say, our business needs this. How do we do lean or TPM or whatever to get there? Because then we know where we want to get to. And we can apply the relevant tools. So we don't send people off doing 5S because it's the right thing. We get them organizing the stalls or the workplace because actually it frees up the space to do what we want to do. Yeah. So the second step, uh, moving from the second to the third, is where we move from down to downtime prevention to defect prevention. So the role of the engineer is not fixing breakdowns. The value add for the engineer, the value add for the maintenance engineer, is optimizing the process. So thinking about the, the engineer as being somebody there as an insurance policy in case it breaks down, you need to flip that to being actually, we want the process to be stable, equipment condition, human error, and we want to use the engineer to optimize the process so we get lower defects, better yield. In food, what's your biggest cost? It's got to be material. Yeah. More than 50% of your manufactured cost. In some cases, it's even higher. So if we can get better yield, and I asked this question before, customers, are they going to want more variety or less? Do you reckon? More variety? Does that mean smaller batches or bigger? Smaller, yeah? More changeovers. So you need processes that waste less material when you change them over and actually can give you a one-touch changeover. So, so part of the, the focus on from downtime to defect prevention is that focus to get engineers freed up from the day-to-day -day breakdown to actually looking at the, um, you know, optimizing the process and thinking about what we could give the, the customer. So that's, that's the TPM sort of roadmap. Um, and again, the, 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 the key theme here 
that I'm bringing in is, is about developing improvement leaders. So our stand DAK Academy, our training side has got a stand here and we, we've developed a number of external courses around developing improvement leaders and you need many of them. In a typical business of 200, you probably need about 15 to 20 at different levels. And as you move through improving OEE, stabilizing and optimizing, they'll have a different role to play. As you get to stable and you release management and engineering time, they'll focus on new products or new equipment, so it will be more project driven. So there's profound changes on the roadmap, and in TPM, it maps out what those changes are. Um, the, um, so we need frontline improvement leaders, cross-function improvement leaders, enterprise improvement leaders, who do that as part of their job. So operators, frontline teams, improvements are team sport. So rather than individual operators, it's frontline teams working together, learning from each other, 5% or so of their time to do that. What, did, what went well last week? What, goes well, what could go well next week? How do we institutionalize that? The right metrics and so on. Um, we need, what, what, when you do that, you release management time, frontline management time, um, to, to do more. And what they typically would be doing is working cross-functionally at, at maybe cross-departmental level. So they need to understand how to do that. And engagement skills. Um, we talk about beyond 5S because 5S is about workplace organisation, but you need, in a real world, you've got linked workplaces. So how do you link them? And how do you make sure that within the workplace you, you, you're maximising control? Uh, and then finally, downtime to defect prevention. Often you're bringing in automation, low-cost automation, because you want to extend mean time between intervention. We, we used to run study tours to Japan. We, we've, in 93, I saw a plant that ran eight hours between intervention, saw how they did it. Simple stuff, just got to, the, the thing that made them deliver that eight hours between intervention was somebody saying, we want eight hours between intervention because that way we get better yield, uh, we can be more flexible, we can put an extra shift on with our extra people. It took them 18 months to do the first line and the, 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 the second line, the, the, second, the, the remaining three lines are in the next 12 months. So it took them about two years. Um, but, but it was the leadership, if you like, that, that gave that first step. And they went from four minutes between intervention to two hours in less than three months. And they really hadn't done anything. It was just making people aware. So there's a whole people dimension. Again, that's sort of built in to the TPM process. But it's, it's, it's what, the, what, what, we, what happens is that people's roles change and, uh, as they evolve. Now, one of the things we've, we've done to help us identify that is we've got a survey of, it says there are 300 executives, it's, it's nearer 600 now. Um, we've been able to distill down the difference at, uh, in, in transition points to around 10 questions. So if you want to take the survey, um, from that survey, totally free of charge and won't hassle you, you just get the answers if you want us to help you, that's great. But if you take the survey, we'll give you a short report on where your strengths and weaknesses are with a recommendation of what to do next. Yeah. So if you visit the stand, DAK Academy, right next to the coffee, um, just as you come in, uh, happy to take your name, send you the survey, send you the report. As I say, I won't bother you unless you want to be bothered, but it, what it should do is give you an insight in terms of where you need to go next. And it's, it's a continuous process. The, the final statement, I suppose, having been to, to um, Japan and, and seen some of the world's best, the ones that really, really uh, succeed are, are the ones that after 25 years are still mapping out the next five years what they're going to do because it's you know life's a learning process customers are changing markets changing all the time so in order to deliver that change you need to make sure that as a, as a company you're looking past today through to tomorrow and of course we talk about the most important people uh, most important resource we've got are people well it, they are and we need to develop those people so this whole thing around developing improvement leaders we find that's actually the, one of the key enablers to going from zero to here Okay, thank you.